everybody, and welcome to this evening's panel and to this evening's uh, session in the Reimagine series. Um, I'm Laurie Turnbull. I'm the director of the School of Public Administration at Dalhousie University, and I'm an associate professor here, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. So before we get started, uh, we first wish to recognize that Dalhousie University sits on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. So welcome. Uh, this, tonight, we're going to be focusing on the theme of learn and work. And so I'm going to let the panelists come to you soon to talk to you about what they've done in their report and what kind of digging that they've done on the topic this evening. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Reimagine project. And so I think this project is similar to projects that have been happening around the world in some ways, in a sense that everybody's looking to how to rebuild after COVID. And so everybody's looking at economic rebuilding, social rebuilding, what kind of skills are we going to need? What kind of knowledge are we going to need going forward? And that's going to be some of the focus tonight. And obviously those things, those considerations apply in Nova Scotia and around the world. Everybody's dealing with a pandemic. But in Nova Scotia, our situation in 2020 has been uh, not only the pandemic, but also uh, we've had the largest mass shooting in Canadian history. Um, we've had a very particular one of the reasons that we wanted to launch this project is to get a sense of what rebuilding in Nova Scotia could look like in light of the very particular circumstances that we've dealt with here. And I think um, the project is, is kind of unique in its design in the sense that it is largely a faculty of management initiative with a lot of help from other faculties across campus, including the faculty of computer science. But it's one of the things that we've done in terms of constructing the groups is we've brought together academics and practitioners and community leaders and students and you know lots of different minds lots of different uh, expertises around certain tables and so that people can cluster people can bring together ideas with people that maybe they have never spoken to these uh, before about these issues in the hopes of kind of sparking some new ideas and new discussions so what ended up happening is that the project got broken down into five specific themes. Every theme had a working group or a cluster that produced a report. And so this is the third panel discussion that we've had, each one on a particular group or a particular report. And so tonight's is Learn and Work. And so we're really, really excited about it. And um, thank you very much for anybody who has joined other panels, but a special welcome to anybody who is joining the Reimagine series for the first time. It's great to have everybody here with us tonight. So um, without any further ado from me, I'm going to start to introduce you to the panelists now, and they're gonna tell you a lot more about the work that they've done um, on this issue. And so I know you're going to learn a lot hearing from them. And so we will have three panelists tonight and then when we finish, uh, when the panelists finish presenting, I'll come back to you. I'm going to pose a question to the panelists, and then we will open up to questions from the audience so that you're able to kind of get into this and, you know, kind of really get involved in the meat of it. And so we're going to make uh, a lot of use of the next 55 minutes. So thanks so much for coming. First, I'm going to introduce you to Bruce McDougall. He is the principal consultant at Burcott, Burcott Park Incorporated. So welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori, for the kind introduction. And it's a, a pleasure being here uh, this evening and, and good evening. Um, as, as was noted earlier this year, I had the pleasure of being part of a, a team of 11 people who considered the future of learning and work as was introduced and uh, as part of this, this um, reimagined Nova Scotia project. Um, the project was co-chaired by um, Professor Andrew Rao Chaplin and Professor Stan Matlin, both of the Department of Computer Science. Uh, here at Dalhousie, and um, the the team was um, was diverse and encompassed a number of points of view, and included people from uh, from academe, and but also people from the, from industry, and uh, um, and many senior representatives from industry, and uh, represented uh, representatives from other communities, um, all of whom were actively involved in um, in the future of, of learning and work in, in Nova Scotia, and it certainly made for uh, it made for some some very lively discussion. And um, so uh, during the course of the discussion, uh, three, three major um, themes emerged and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about them briefly and then, um, and then I'll go on to some conclusions. So the, the three major themes that we discussed were 
Um, the first one was digital literacy and inclusion and how um, access, inclusion, and digital literacy are really the bedrock of, of our economic and social well-being in Nova Scotia uh, today and most, and most importantly in the future. Um, so that was one of our, 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 our major themes. The second one was uh, the digital talent pool. Um, and knowing that um, the, the, the digital world is, is a major vector of growth of, of the economy in Nova Scotia, um, we really need to address the need for workers with skill sets that reflect the needs of this digital economy. And, uh, and this is a favorite topic of, of Professor Rao Chaplin, and he'll, he'll um, speak about it later, but it, was, um, it created a great deal of, of, um, of excellent discussion. Um, the third, um, third major theme was um, the role of data and particularly access to data and policies surrounding access to data and, uh, and how this um, and how uh, good access to um, public data sets leads to uh, better evidence for uh, policymakers and, um, and how this can, can lead to just better decision making on the whole. And uh, there's a certain amount of discussion about how, um, how we can improve access to data. So that's a, that was also a, a major theme. Um, we noted that uh, all, all of our discussions and the, and the themes we, we discussed um, all, uh, all come, um, th there's a thing called the, the global technological revolution that is occurring and it's, it is the backdrop for, for learning and work. It's the backdrop for uh, most of the economic activity in, 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 in the world today or the growth of economic activity. And it's so important to Nova Scotians and it's so um, very important for us to understand where we stand uh, in that, but it's definitely the, the, the backdrop for, for what we're doing. And um, it's often referred to as digitalization. And, uh, and the idea of the digitalization uh, now encompasses all sectors of our economy and all facets of, of learning, whether, whether you're a researcher, a student, a teacher, uh, a consumer, or, or a producer. It, it, it really permeates the world and it's the largest source of uh, change that we see today in, in the economy and, uh, and the largest source of change in, in, in globally. Um, so uh, it was also noted that um, the COVID-19 crisis, which, which brought us, really brought us all together, uh, has accelerated a lot of the trends that, that are occurring and um, brought into a, a very sharp focus some uh, changes and, and made changes occur at a faster rate than they would otherwise have, have, uh, have occurred. And, um, and, and you know, COVID-19 has, has caused us to pay much more attention to, to these, these things. Um, I would I would encourage everyone to to read the full text of the report. It's available to everyone who's who's online tonight and attending this event. And uh, I would encourage everyone to to take a look at it. Um, as we did our report, the the report outlines seven recommendations, um, each of which has uh, specific calls to action. And um, and we'll spend the next little while with the three of us. Um, uh, focusing on these recommendations with the goal of, of launching a, a lively discussion this evening. So um, I, I will present um, three of the recommendations of the seven um, related to access to digital resources um, and most notably the internet. Um, I will, that'll be one of them. I'll also discuss where we believe we, um, we stand in, in terms of um, 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 digital technologies and, di and the adoption of, um, of digital technologies in the business and public sector in uh, Nova Scotia and, and what this looks like in the, uh, the post-COVID COVID world. Uh, so following this, I I'll discuss those, those conclusions and uh, following this, I'll pass it on to, to my colleagues who will discuss the other recommendations and I think um, Professor Rao Chapman will, will wrap it up. So, uh, so that's kind of where we're going. Um, our first recommendation uh, relates to the digital divide and access to the digital world. Um, you know, if, if you imagine for a moment um, living in a world without access to, uh, to the internet, um, it, it's inconceivable for a lot of people, but that is the reality today for a significant number of households in, in rural Nova Scotia and in some places that wouldn't even be described as rural. Um, and it's also, again, most notably, um, a, um, uh, true for um, many disadvantaged and marginalized communities and including um, many First Nation communities. And um, well, while that is important, um, access to digital assets is not only the internet. It is 
it is uh, affordable access, it is culturally appropriate access, and um, and it, it is um, it has to be combined with learning. So there is a there is a world of opportunity that exists at the other end of that uh, of that divide, shall we say. So um, you know I, I deal daily with people who are um, who are working. Uh, for clients in other on other continents and other countries, and who are buying services from people in other uh, other continents and other countries, and um, and that's just not available if you don't have internet access, you don't know what to do with it, you don't have devices in your home, um, and and it's not culturally appropriate to you. So that that was a very big point for us. Um, we we noted and applauded. Um, the Internet for Nova Scotia initiative, which I think many people are aware of, it's a provincial government government initiative. Um, we think that it doesn't go far enough. Uh, we think it should be accelerated, and we also think um, that it you know it should be monitored carefully to make sure it it gets to where it's supposed to get. Um, we also further noted that it it has a, um, a target of ninety five percent penetration for um, for rural internet rural broadband internet. Um, I'll ask you the question: How many people in Nova Scotia? Um, you know, who in Nova Scotia is without electricity? Uh, it's not five percent of the population. So that ninety-five percent uh, goal, we think, is uh, could be could be improved. Um, and we think that the uh, broadband internet is as much a, a utility as is electricity. But yet, there's there's virtually nobody. I, I wouldn't say there's a dozen households in Nova Scotia that are crying for for a, a electric service that don't have it. So um, so that's that's interesting. Um, Without these these things in place, without access to these assets, um, we will not learn enough about the digital world um, to be effective participants in the global economy uh, this, of the next decades. And um, if we do a good job of this, it will it will serve us well in terms of, of growing the economy of Nova Scotia, growing the GDP, and essentially, um, you know, I increasing the social and, and economic well being of, uh, of of Nova Scotians. And uh, and you know this this has all been brought into into much sharper focus um, by uh, by COVID and by other other events. Um, so there you go. Um, I will be happy to discuss this this conclusion further in in uh, uh, later on. Um, another um, uh, another two conclusions we came to, or I guess I'm going to roll them into one here, um, were with regard to the level of digital adoption. Uh, so once again, this is part of digitalization. And it speaks to the level of productivity gains that we in Nova Scotia are introducing into the you know business and public sector environments based on digital technologies. This is about remaining um, globally competitive, and um, and which is so important. And it, it really um, we we must see ourselves as in the context of the of the global economy and global comp and being globally competitive. Um, so in support of that, we're advocating for further support for the um, adoption of digital technologies across all sectors of the economy. Um, and this is an efficient and, and uh, a great way of increasing, uh, once again, increasing our productivity, increasing the, the GDP. I'd, I'd like to just refer for a moment to um, uh, a program presented by Digital Nova Scotia recently that aimed at encouraging digital adoption in the tourism industry. Uh, it was a great success. And uh, it will likely result in uh, in measurable increase in the productivity in that sector. So, so things like that, uh, we think, need further support. Uh, on a larger scale, we've um, we note that the uh, you know there's there's been a significant um, success in the the ocean technology sector, and we feel that this sector could further benefit um, uh, the province and and lead to. Uh, um, a move towards more rewarding digital rich businesses and, and occupations. Um, and, you know, an example is uh, what's going on at Cove, um, the ocean super cluster, and, uh, and at Dalhousie, right, right here, Dalhousie is the, the Deep Sense project, which is a, a collaboration between Dalhousie and, and IBM. And I think these guys are, are data miners of the ocean. And it's, a, it's a very, uh, you know, this is, this is where our economy will grow. It's with initiatives like that. And we just think they need more support. Uh, this also applies to SMEs. And um, and it also applies to the public sector, um, and we you know we see good things in the public sector. Uh, for instance, the uh, in Nova Scotia, the um, IBM's Global Delivery Center. But we note that um, this success must be driven further into rural areas and into disadvantaged communities. So um, that was that was a combination of two 
um, conclusions. And um, and there you go. I'll I'll be happy to discuss either topic later in the in the question period. But now I'll pass it back to uh, uh, to Lori. Thank you. Bruce, thank you so much. There is a lot of information in what you just said. And so I'm, I'm really excited to get back to some of those topics as, as we will in the question and answer series. So that's great. Thank you so much, Bruce. So next I'm gonna welcome Diane Tires. She is the Dean of the College of Continuing Education here at Dalhousie. So welcome. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to two of the recommendations that came out of our support. And these are both around education because we can't have um, a digital strategy and digital ideas um, for a region and for an economy without thinking about how do we actually help people get these skills in order to be able to function in a digital economy. So the, the two recommendations that I'm going to speak to are around this. How do, how do we help Nova Scotians get the digital skills that they need? So, so the first recommendation is um, that we need to make sure that we provide opportunities for Nova Scotians to acquire digital skills across all elements of the education ecosystem. So what do I mean by the education ecosystem? This is all of the different ways and systems and opportunities that we give people to learn. So there's formal learning. So we've got our K to 12 part of the ecosystem. We've got college, university, private um, learning opportunities. We've got individual op learning opportunities, professional development, training offered by companies. So across all of these elements of the education ecosystem, we really need to look at how do we provide our um, citizens with the opportunity to acquire these digital skills. And digital skills change very, very quickly. So we, you know, we often learn a technology and two to three years later, we have to learn a new one. So it's very much an ongoing process. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to provide these learning opportunities across all elements of this education ecosystem. So we, we identified some really specific actions that, that we need to take um, provincially and regionally in order to ensure that everyone has these opportunities to learn. So the first one um, is, is to do a survey of global best practices. So there, there are best practices in other countries and other regions around ensuring that, that digital skills are taught at all levels of the ecosystem. So we need to do a, a scan and, and identify who are the, the people who are doing these best practices and what are those best practices. Then we need to, to identify what are the gaps. So what, what is Nova Scotia doing well when we compare them to these best practices? And, and what does Nova Scotia need to do better when we look at these best practices around digital skills? Then we need to, to start to build partnerships. So um, it's not just the, the job of the government or the school board or universities or colleges to address these digital skills. Everyone has to, to play their part. And in order to do that, we need to partner. So we need to partner with industry. We need to partner with all of the different elements of the education ecosystem. We need to partner with different community groups. Um, and so a foundation of getting these digital skills across the whole region really are these partnerships that we need to craft. Um, Another piece that we need to look at is, is innovative programming. So digital skills really allow us to have a lot of fun with the education experience. And there's a lot of great innovation that we can do in terms of how we teach people digital skills. So for example, here at the university, we're, we're working to, to form partnerships so that um, with the university expertise, we can then partner with other education um, organizations and other education elements of the ecosystem to create, to, to provide innovative programming. This allows us to use the, the expertise here at the university and then share it out with, with different um, parts of the community and different um, types of students in, in the different um, education delivery systems. So there's a lot of really fun stuff that we can do um, with digital uh, programming to teach these digital skills. And even though like COVID-19 has been unbelievably stressful across all the sectors and across you know, all the types of work we do, but some really good stuff has come out of it because COVID-19 really forced education organizations to try new things when it comes to the use of digital technologies in education and when it comes to upskilling people in these digital skills. So here at Dahazi, we've seen just, just really fun experimentation. Our faculty and our instructors have just jumped right on board to, to try different ways to um, use digital technologies and train their students in digital technologies. And so a, a really, really valuable takeaway from COVID-19 across the entire education sector is 
the, the potential we have for this innovative programming. So our instructors have upskilled, our teachers have upskilled, our students have upskilled. And so this is something that we really wanna make sure that we don't lose uh, post COVID-19. We wanna use the, the really fabulous foundation of, of innovative programming that we've built and use that to launch even more innovative programming. So there's some really, really exciting work that we can do here with this innovative programming. Um, and then another piece that we wanna do with uh, digital skills in our education ecosystem is we really wanna strengthen the digital skills um, development programs at the college and university level, because the, this is where we're preparing um, our, our students to go into the labor market. And so this is one of our really key opportunities to make sure our college and university students have the skills that align with what the labor market needs. So do they have the digital skills that employers want and can they go to employers and say, look, I've got these skills that you need. And then we've got a really, really good match between the skills that we're standing, sending our students off with into the workforce and then what employers need. So getting that match is, is really, really key. So there's a lot of great and, and very, very exciting and very innovative work that we can do around building our education ecosystem so that it can give Nova Scotians and help Nova Scotians develop those digital skills. So then the second um, recommendation that, that comes out of, uh, that came out of our work is also around education and this is around lifelong learning. So we don't, we don't stop our learning now when it comes to, you know, I've finished my university degree, so I'm gonna stop learning or I've finished my college and I'm gonna stop learning. That's not how the world works anymore. Um, we all have to understand that we are going to continually learn throughout our entire career. So we're learning from kindergarten all the way up until we, we retire. And sometimes we keep learning even after we retire. So lifelong learning is our new reality. And we need to look at all of the different opportunities that lifelong learning provides us to provide people with the digital skills that they need. So lifelong learning is going to be a really, really key piece in making sure that all Nova Scotians have the digital skills that they need to um, be effective in the workplace and also keep their digital skills uh, current to what employers need and current to what the region really needs. So lifelong learning is, a, is another space where there's some really, really fun stuff going on and this is where we can have an impact. So some specific recommendations um, around life learning came out of our work. And, and the first one is around the type of learning experience that we provide our learners with. So the very, very traditional learning experience is students sit in a classroom, the teacher's at the front of the classroom and the teacher decides what students are going to learn. Now we've got the technologies and different ideas around learning to, to completely change what, how that happens. We can create little tiny chunks of learning called micro learning, and then we can reward that learning with different types of micro credentials. And so this micro learning and micro credentialing in lifelong learning is a really, really exciting uh, space that we can control, uh, that we can explore. And um, we really wanna look at this for digital technologies because it really lends itself very well to this. Um, the other thing that we wanna do is just really get um, slightly longer, but not full degree type learning going on. So we can do like short three month programs, six month programs, one year programs to upscale people a little bit more, um, slightly bigger chunks than the micro credentialing and the micro learning. And then finally, we can look at, you know, can we create really, really innovative programming around what we do uh, with our university students? Can we create um, new undergraduate type programs and graduate type programs in order to um, really give the students the skills they need and the learners they need uh, and the learning they need in order to be effective in the workplace when it comes to digital skills? So we can have a lot of fun with this whole concept of lifelong learning from the little tiny bits of learning that we provide, that we do on our own, that we can provide through professional development to slightly longer chunks of learning to, to longer really innovative degree um, and postgraduate degree programming. So that's the other area that we explored. So we explored the overall education ecosystem and then the lifelong learning piece of that ecosystem. So um, these, these are some really fun, um, innovative areas that we can look at. So back over to you, Lori. Diane, thank you so much. I love this concept of, of a kind of a learning ecosystem and educational ecosystem. That's fantastic. And I know there's a lot of organizations that are doing work on 
um, how digital transformation is affecting the workforce and what the future workforce looks like and things like that. And I've kind of wondered like what kind of role universities are going to play in that. And and I think you're absolutely right. COVID-19 has been a time for so much innovation at the uni at universities across Nova Scotia and across the country. And so I think it's it's really neat to be thinking about partnerships. I really like that point around how we can work to build skills quickly and to be able to respond to what the job market needs and to what students need. So there's so much to chew on here. This is great. I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to introduce you to Andrew Rao Chaplin. Andrew is the Dean of the Faculty of Computer Science here at Dalhousie. So welcome. Well, thank you and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say this, but uh, I, I think the future is digital. And I think that one of the keys to you know, the economic future of Nova Scotia is to continue to grow our booming tech sector. Um, and this is really uh, cuts to two of the main recommendations in the report that I want to talk about. Um, so the, really the first is about the digital talent pool. There's a fantastic report that I suggest you know, everyone should read uh, that's interested in the economy here in Atlantic Canada that was released by APEC on the digital technology firms. I mean, it estimated that uh, revenues from tech, you know, were up at $2.5 billion in 2017 here in Atlantic Canada, and were increasing at 7% per year uh, for the last uh, something like five years, which is well above the national average. Um, you know, tech as an area uh, is producing a large amount of uh, exports. It's actually our third largest exports. You have oil first, you have lobsters second, and kind of nipping at the tail of those lobsters is, is digital and tech. Um, so there's a huge possibility to continue to grow this. What are the impediments? Well, the APEC you know, report highlights really three key challenges. The need to grow the talent pool. Companies said that the biggest impediment to their growth was the need for more digital talent, more software engineers in particular. Number two, attract more anchor tech companies. The interesting thing is, why do anchor co tech companies relocate to Atlantic Canada and Nova Scotia? It's because of the talent pool. So this links right back to that first issue. And number three, and this was you know, referenced by Bruce, really the need to drive digital adoption you know, rates across all firms, because digital influences not just the software firms, but really the ICT firms, you know, and really the whole ecosystem of, of industry here. So I think recommendation four is interesting because it's, it's a little bit more provocative maybe than some of the other recommendations. The recommendation is to double the number of university and Nova Scotia Community College graduates in computer programming, computer science, and software engineering. You know, really with the goal of having this virtuous effect of increasing industry uh, in this sector, bringing in new companies and really growing the economy. Nova Scotia has already become Canada's leading center for outsourcing, software outsourcing, and this is something we can really build on. So how do we get there? We need to invest in capacity, we need to increase funding to fund those extra seats, we need to really promote the intellectual richness and economic possibility of computing uh, as a discipline to know the Scotian youth. We need to think about this in the context of immigration. Imagine, for instance, a digital study and stay program that explicitly links um, studying digital tech here in Nova Scotia with staying. You know, we have programs which have uh, a large number of international students and have over 70% of those students say they want to stay not only in Canada, but they want to stay and work here in Nova Scotia. So I think there are great possibilities here. The second, rec second recommendation that I want to talk about is about data. You probably heard that little catchphrase, uh, data is the new oil. Um, it really has become 
central to intelligent planning, sustainability, government services, good social policy, healthcare, uh, and really all of these in all of these areas, it's empowering decision making. So I think the pandemic has really highlighted the need for data sharing during a crisis. It's very hard to make informed decisions unless you have the available data and that data is of suitable quality. We collect it all over the place and our public sector collects an enormous amount of it. It's an incredible resource. Um, data privacy is you know, really uh, an important issue. Uh, we need to balance our need for privacy and our need to use that data to make informed decisions. We need to begin to have, I think, um, a more nuanced view of how we manage the risk and reward equation around data, particularly data that is collected as a public good and as a public source. It needs not to be a binary decision, you know, lock up tight or release fully, but we need to be able to think about things on that spectrum, um, depending on the sensitivity data and the prudential use of it. So our recommendation seven is to establish an open by default policy for Nova Scotian public data. The province needs to recognize that it collects data and manages through its many pro, you know, programs, and that data is a public asset. And we need to figure out the mechanics of how we exploit that as a source of wealth and as a tool to improve the life and livelihood of Nova Scotians. Um, you know, in some sense, what we'd like to think about is, can we reverse the data access model? Can we think about how to collect data that by default is public, obviously subject to anonymization and privacy preserving uh, techniques, um, and the data access is only constrained if the province can justify that to a particular case? Clearly, there are particular cases, but at the moment, we take a fairly um, risk-centric, legalistic view to the protection of data. And I think that's holding us back. So what could we do here? Um, implement a pilot program, for instance, around provincial data access using more of a risk value analysis um, rather than a strict legalistic uh, view. You know, it's hard to find the data that you need, particularly in the instance when you're in a pandemic and you really need it. So think about setting up a yellow pages, if you like, for Nova Scotia data, where metadata is available and searchable. Um, you know, it would require using you know, international standards around metadata access, but we can adopt those from other jurisdictions. Perhaps we could set up a, a scientific data advisory council, uh, incorporating experts from government, university, hospitals, and industries that are able to, you know, assess the risks and response uh, and really design. There's a chance here. Nova Scotia is this beautiful size. You know, I think we have an opportunity here to harness the data that we are collecting for public good. So I get to summarize up to summarize this whole conversation, which I think is near impossible. Um, you know, so I'll just say that, you know, COVID has been an incredible challenge for all of us across industries, um, certainly within the educational industry, uh, but across the SMEs and, and, and large companies. I don't think it's an event that we ever imagined. Um, you know, we've changed tremendously. Just cast your mind back nine months. Um, it's hard to believe it's only been nine months. It feels like a lifetime of change. We've discovered that we can, um, you know, really operate using digital technologies in ways we never imagined before. How many of us are working from home? How many of us are actually experiencing in this moment opportunities in which work accelerates, in which we actually have you know, a closer connection to many of our peers. 
I, I don't want to underestimate the challenges, the stresses, the incredible costs and, 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 and significant suffering that's taken place um, you know, during this event. Um, but we have learned a lot. And I think there's an incredible opportunity for us to think about in a, in a, in a deep and meaningful way, what we, do we take out of this moment and into the new mo you know, new normal that we're evolving into. So at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Laurie, but I'm so interested to get into the questions. Over to you, Laurie. Andrew, thank you so much for that. And yeah, I agree. I think it would be like pretty much impossible to try to sum up this whole conversation. So I'm not going to try to do that at all. I'm just going to sort of give everybody a chance to catch their breath for a moment. And then I'm going to open questions up a little bit. So I think um, what we'd really like to do is, is hear more from the panelists on some of the issues that they've raised here, because there's obviously a lot of meat in this report. There's a lot to chew on here. There's a lot of ideas lots of really positive energy around where Nova Scotia can go in terms of playing a leading role. And so what I'd really like to, is to get into some of that to see um, what we can take away from this and how we can look forward a bit. And so the first question that I would throw out there, and I know you've all spoken to it to a certain extent, but I wouldn't mind the opportunity just to kind of throw it back at you a bit for a little bit more, is in terms of first steps, right? Like what can we do um, in terms of trying to bridge the digital divide in Nova Scotia? So not just big picture, but what kind of what should we do tomorrow to see see some progress on this? Who wants to jump in first there? Who, who would you like to hear from, Lori? Oh, um, I can be so maybe Bruce because you you've you've been quiet the longest. Oh, I, that's that's very unusual for me, but thank you. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, I think. As Andrew said, there's no, there's, there are a bunch of issues going on here. It's very hard to, to sort of bring them together in one theme. Um, the digital divide in Nova Scotia, it's a question of infrastructure, so internet access. It's a question of learning resources, as, as Diane mentioned. And it's a question of, you know, the, the, the infrastructure leads to learning. The learning leads to, to uh, labor force. And, you know, that's Andrew's thing. So it, it really is a pipeline. So we really have to get people in a place where they can enter into this this stream, um, do whatever learning they need to do, and then enter the, the labor force. And I think that's that's a real um, uh, vector for success, uh, but it, it it requires a, a lot of input from in, in a lot of different sectors from a lot of different people. So uh, maybe that's just kind of priming the pump. And I'm sorry I can't answer more clearly than that, but it's, no, that's great. it's all of those things. Yep. I think I would just like to add, um, why is it so important, particularly important, that in the digital space that we reach out to diverse population you know i think digital is is is, is not unique it's particularly the case that when you build digital systems you reflect your value your history your language your culture and what you build is really a product of your mind and so it's so incredibly important in this space that we have uh, representation from all of Canadian society. I, I don't want to live into the future in which what we did build, you know, represents just a fragment of who we are. That's not the place we want to go. Um, so it's really critical. I mean, that lack of access, okay, is hurting everybody. It's really clear if you talk to leading, um, you know, executives in industry, everybody has woken up to how important you know, equity and diversity is in this sector. And I'll jump jump on on both what Bruce and Andrew have said there. That you know, one one of the major gaps in this digital skills pipeline really really is around those learning experiences, and it's it's learning experiences that speak to everyone in the society, not just certain segments of the society, not just students who self identify as as loving technology. But it's a it, it's learning gaps that exist around every citizen, and every citizen is going to have slightly different learning gaps. And so we really need to to do a deep dive in, and understand what are the gaps of of all of these different groups of potential learners, and then how are we going to address the needs of all of those learners? 
um, because it's very easy when we talk digital skills and digital education and upskilling that, that we just focus on the people who naturally gravitate that way. Mm -hmm. But if we're not going to leave everyone else behind, we have to really look at, um, yes, we've got these people who love technology and love digital, but we need to look at everyone else um, and how do we get them going where they need to go. That's a fantastic point. Okay, I am going to thank you for for everyone's answers to that question. I really appreciate that. I am going to go to questions from the audience now. So this is a question from Sean. Can you speak more to digital focus um, within sectors of the economy, not pure or just tech sectors? Good question. Many businesses are adapting. NSBI's digital adoption program is receiving a lot of across, of uh, support, maybe of, across sectors. I think it's a great point, and you know, I think this echoes back to the APEC report which really identified digital adoption as an area where, to be honest, Nova Scotia is lagging. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, you just think about the small businesses which had to pivot in this moment. You know, the mm -hmm. coffee shop who needed to figure out how do I support online ordering or the doctor that needed to figure out how do I take patient reservations online. Um, I think it's fair to say that more and more of our economy, whatever business you're in, is going to be mediated by these technologies. Um, so how do we drive that adoption? I think it's about mix, you know, one of the keys is to mix people with digital skills and digital enthusiasm with our core businesses. Um, and it's really, you know, the biggest transfer uh, is, is, is really from the young with these new skills. I mean, who do you call to, you know, fix your cell phone um, and and our core Nova Scotian businesses? Yeah, and, and I'll just jump in. I, I, I'm in my previous life, I was a small business owner. And so as I watched small businesses trying to navigate COVID, I was just celebrating all of their wins when it came to using technology. So as Andrew said, the coffee shop and the restaurant that figured out how do we do online ordering, the, the vendors, the retail vendors, how do we do online ordering, you know, all of, how do we do online consulting? Every small business owner, my heart just went out to them and, and I celebrated every win they had when it came to using technology to, to navigate COVID. And, and this really is going to make the difference. Our, our technology companies are going to, to thrive with digital because that's what they are. The, the true sign of success mm -hmm. is going to be the small businesses that are not technology businesses that use technology to, to drive their business. And this is what we really need to take the time to celebrate um, the, the accomplishments of these small businesses. I think digital adoption means uh, adopting technology to the use in your business. And I, I really like the idea of, you know, I, I go deal with a grocery store and almost overnight they were doing uh, online ordering, online payments, uh, you know, come and you know, book your time to pick up your groceries. And they did it amazingly. Some didn't. And those are the ones that are, that are, are in, in real trouble, the ones that need, need more help from us. But, um, you know, people associate the um, tech revolution with, you know, high tech companies and, uh, and and people working in the industry. But it's how people in other industries apply the technology to, to remain or become more globally competitive. Right. Yeah. OK, um, another great question. As we move forward with a more digital centric focus and a digital strategy, how do we address socioeconomic barriers to participation? And how do we ensure equitable access? Back to you, Bruce. Did I hear I, I have to answer that one, do I? I <laughs> um, you know, it, it comes down to um, there's a role to play for our educational system. Um, but, but let me just say this as well. When it comes to internet access, there really is no excuse for not having internet access to 100% mm -hmm. of homes in Nova Scotia. You know, if you look at, at uh, a roadway by a house, there's uh, a gas line, there's an electric, you know, there's electric power, there's a sewage line, and there's a water line, and there's paving, and there's an internet line. The cheapest part of that whole kit is the internet line. So there is really no, there's no excuse for that, and we really need to fix it. And it's it's kind of a, in a regulatory failure in Canada. Uh, um, you know, it's a federal federally regulated um, industry, and there's all kinds of things that we can talk about there. But it just needs to be fixed, and and quickly. And that is that is the the, the starting point. Uh, to add to that, I mean, I think you know, 
we really want our economy to be rich and vibrant and reach all across the province to all of the rural areas um to 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 reservations to you know small towns and and, and villages and suddenly there's an opportunity in this moment you know the internet suddenly gives you an opportunity to perhaps work or um anywhere you want to engage i mean i have a friend he's a hollywood film editor and you know he has a shack in the country uh, that is something that wouldn't have been possible um so you know i, I think there's a chance to even out opportunity among the group if we can get our infrastructure right and I, and I would agree with uh, Bruce. There's really kind of no excuse at this moment. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in. So, so you know, Bruce and Andrew have highlighted the interconnectivity as, as, a, as a barrier. And then the other barrier is the hardware. Um, you know, not everyone can afford an iPad, uh, you know, a smartphone, a laptop, and so on. And so we really um, need to look at how can we use our publicly funded institutions to address the hardware gap as well. You know, so libraries are doing fantastic work in making um, computers uh, accessible to the community. Um, university libraries are, are making uh, computers available to students who can't afford their own laptops. And um, we had a really, really wonderful success story. We run the Transition Year program um, at the college, and this is a program for Indigenous students and Black Nova Scotians. And we were concerned that we were have, we we're going to have to run our programs online, but we didn't know if all of these students could actually have access to a laptop. So um, we worked with University Advancement and an anonymous donor. And to this day, I don't know who it is, but a, a huge thanks to them provided funding for us to get laptops for all of the students in this program. Um, and these are the types of initiatives that you know, getting our public institutions to to provide the hardware um, donors uh, to to provide the hardware that that can you know bridge the part of this socioeconomic gap as well. Fant wow, fantastic. Okay, um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm gonna try to st stick in some questions here. Um, from Nicole, what are some examples of innovative things that instructors are trying out in their classrooms? That's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna volunteer Andrew, cause he's yeah. got some amazing stuff going on in his faculty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. We're, well, I'm going <laughs> this yeah. is uh, you know, an incredible moment for, for, for educators. You know, I, I have a faculty, for instance, who is passionate about their research, but I've never seen a moment in which more people were willing to push that aside and say, what's cold, what, what's, what do I need to do to deliver the best, highest quality education in this moment? And one of the things that's really changed, I think, a little bit is, you know, pre-COVID, what was, you know, an instructor or professor might go off and design a course, but very much by themselves. Um, and what's happened in this moment is these vibrant communities have, evolved, you know, have just sprung up in which, you know, individual professors and instructors are sharing what they're learning. Uh, and there's this rapid development as we say, okay, well, you know, uh, how do you reverse the classroom and how do you get engagement in this moment? What kind of digital tools are available and what's the right balance of, you know, many small risk assignments and um, and then on the other side, you know, does that drown somebody in too much work? And how do I stay in contact with my, my, my students who in this moment might be scattered around the world, might be time shifted? Um, and I think we've seen a rededication to the core of education, to, to sharing the process um, that I haven't seen in my lifetime. Um, we've got a ways to go, but we're gonna come out of this moment with these, these curriculum that we can deliver online. And no, we're not gonna to be 100% online. I can't wait to get into a room with a bunch of students and answer questions and see those light bulbs go on. But there are gonna be elements that we can take out of this and we can explore blended deliveries. We can explore how can we use these tools to reach pockets of the province that we might not have been able to reach and provide educational opportunities to people who maybe can't come, you know, and and spend all, you know, a whole bunch of time here in Halifax. Um, so I think there are huge opportunities. The techno the innovations are in teaching practice. They're also in 
technology um, as well. Yeah, and, and can I just emphasize, I love Andrew's use of the word tools, um, because a lot of people think, you know, there's often a lot of fear that technology is going to take the place of an instructor or a teacher and so on. And that's never going to happen. Um, technology, it, it's a tool. And where the innovation comes into is, is figuring out how am I going to use this tool for this learning outcome? And there, there's so many technical tools and technology tools available to us. And, and the really um, powerful and impactful uh, teachers and instructors, they, they match the right tool with the learning outcome that they're going for. And that's really where we've seen some fantastic innovation is selecting the right tool for the learning outcome and the learning experience that the instructor or the, or the teacher is going after. Okay. I am going to put up, a, this is going to be a really interesting question. I can see it, but not everybody can see it right now. Um, yeah. Will Elon Musk's Starlink low earth orbit satellite system, got that out, uh, change the way we access the internet for the better? Bruce, I, what do you I'll, I'll give that a whirl. So, uh, <laughs> so the, the answer to that is, is unfortunately yes and, and no. Um, yes, in the sense that it, it, I believe, has the potential to um, revolutionize what happens in uh, in Canada's north and other remote areas in the world, as opposed to rural areas. So the answer for rural areas is no. It is still cheaper to uh, still cheaper to to actually put wired service into rural areas, uh, and we should remember that and remind politicians of that when they say, "Oh, you know, the problem's gone away because Elon Musk's satellite should be." It will not be the solution for rural areas. It'll be more expensive. It will be a great solution for um, the north. It will be a great solution when you're at sea or on Baffin Island or or somewhere else. Um, but uh, the um, you know, one of the things that's happened over the last 20 years is we've, you know, we've been through a series of communication technologies, um, and this is this is very difficult to regulate an industry where technology is changing, but that technology has now landed. Uh, everyone does fiber to the home. That works. It's going to be around for. I'm saying this in public, and I don't believe it, but it's going to be around for, for another 20 years, um, and it's it's really dirt cheap. Um, Elon Musk satellites would be a great solution for the, the North. They are going to be expensive to operate. That's my, my little prediction. So I, I'm interested to hear what others have to say, but that's kind of where I, where I land with it. The, the real key is uh, don't, don't let um, people off the hook with regard to rural broadband in Nova Scotia because this may or may not arrive. It, it will arrive, but it may, I don't believe it'll be the solution. Okay. Um, we are going to try to throw in another lightning round here. Um, I wonder how come we can name and predict the skills needed both now and in the future to provide digital skills training and connect subject matter experts with educational institutions? Great question. Really great question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, again, um, you know, this moment, when suddenly we're mediating the classroom and teaching through technology opens up new possibility. I think of the, you know, I, we have uh, literally thousands of alumni out there that are experts in different pieces of the technology. Uh, wouldn't it be great to be able just to uh, pull in three views uh, from experts and networking if we're, you know, in a networking class and uh, a question is posed. Um, I, I think there are all sorts of interesting new ways to pull, to, to blur the line between the, the world of work and the world of education. And whether that be through micro-credentials, whether that be through short courses, whether that be by pulling people into the classroom or taking students and extending them out into the working world. And all of these variants are more uh, possible in this moment than they've ever been. And I think that's terrifically exciting. Yeah, and, I, and I'm going to take a, a bit of a, a different uh, approach to this and, and say, I actually don't think we can predict the skills needed. Um, I think the technologies are, are changing so quickly. So like if I had a, a child who was you know, in grade five right now, I don't actually think we can predict 
what skills that that what technical skills um, that that child will need uh, when he or she gets into the workforce because it's just changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a technical person. Um, this is me from an education perspective. And so part of our report and part of our discussion in, in forming the report was um, what are the the, the non-technical skills that we need to to give our students and our learners so that they can then have the skills to learn the digital skills. Um, because we can't predict the digital skills, but we can, um, we've, we've done, a, there's a lot of good research around those, those what, what are now called durable skills um, that enable, that, that prep our, our children for that future world of work. And so these are things like, um, you know, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, um, agility, resilience, these are the, the, the pieces that will allow our, our children of today to, to thrive in a, in a digital world where we really can't predict the digital skills they'll need. Yeah, that, that's, my, that's my take on it. I don't know, I, I have to jump in with just a slight twist on this one. <laughs> You're so, quite about this, Andrew. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've been in computing for 40 years and I have to say, the more things change, the more they're the same that a certain level of abstraction, when you think about education as opposed to training, the education is durable. The, the kinds of ways to think about um, whether it's algorithms or whether it's you know uh, the languages we use to interact, they stay remarkable. The issues and, 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 and approaches stay remarkably the same. What, there's a kind of chatter as the individual shiny technologies change and morph. Um, but as long as we focus on education, as well as some skills, can't have one without the other, I think people have robust learning. And they don't need to be afraid that it's just going to stale date. It, it'll mm -hmm. hold them in good stead over a longer run. Absolutely agree. The fundamentals are, are pretty, pretty static. OK, I'll concede that one to you, Andrew. <laughs> Okay, so as a wrap up, and again, really lightning around this time, um, thank you for the great work. It's hard to disagree with any of the report conclusions. They make good sense. I agree. I'm curious, what's next? Where do we go from here? I think there are lots of individual recommendations that are just kind of ready to run with. Yep. And I know amongst our smaller group, you know, the, I mean, the larger group from what you're seeing tonight, there are people that are really passionate about each of those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look forward to working with you and, and with, you know, the audience here, because I think this is, we're all concerned about the life and health of Nova Scotians and, and the economy in Nova Scotia. And so I think there's lots of things that we can do together in this space to advance these recommendations. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, I would, I would just totally echo that. I think, um, I think the recommendations are, are, are very solid, and, and, and those are our next steps. Yeah. Let's, let's just not leave the rural areas behind and disadvantaged communities. They really have to concentrate on them. That is a great note to end on. Um, let me extend um, thanks on behalf of everybody today for a fantastic panel discussion. We really, really appreciate the life that, that the three of you brought to this topic. This was a great conversation and we have a lot, uh, a lot to take from this. We've all learned a lot. Um, so thank you. Thank you very, very much for all the work that you've done in this, not just tonight, but for everything that you've brought in terms of your expertise to this report. It's fantastic. So next week, uh, please join us again if you can. We'll be back here to talk about cultivating and consuming. So thank you so much to everybody for logging in tonight. We had a great time with you. And see you next week. Hopefully. Good night. Bye.